So welcome to CS891. This is the Scalable Microservices course. I'm gonna start out by giving you an overview of what we're gonna cover in the class. And we'll start out by talking about the overall philosophy of the course. I'll give you a summary of the course contents, as well as a description of how the lecture material is structured. So why are we teaching this class? Well, there's a growing need and a continual need for software developers who know how to write programs that will take advantage of multi-core processors and the features available for concurrent and parallel programming, in this case, in largely in Java, as well as people who know how to package up applications into a collection of microservices. And we'll talk a lot more about what microservices are shortly, but you could basically think of microservices as little components that can be performing some task and can be clumped together and orchestrated in order to be able to provide a more fulsome capability. And this is important for lots of types of systems now, mobile devices, laptops, desktops, cloud environments. People are using concurrent and parallel programming in order to build systems out of modular pieces that can be con configured and deployed in a variety of different ways. Why is this happening? Well, there's a couple of reasons. First of all, as you've probably noticed over the past 20 years or so, we've moved away from processors and processor cores that get faster by a predictable amount every 18 to 24 months. That's that's what we know as Moore's law. And what Moore's law really says is, is not processors get faster, but the number of transistors on a chip will get more plentiful. They'll double effectively every 18 to 24 months. And that's actually continuing because of a variety of issues having to do with uh, heat and other issues of trying to build smaller and smaller transistors, we don't necessarily get more speed up anymore, but we still have lots of transistors. And so the way that that's playing out is we're using those transistors to make more and more cores. So nowadays, almost every chip you get is a multi-core processor, usually two to four cores, and processors are coming out with quite a lot more than that. My laptop that I'm using here to present the slides has 10 cores. You can get probably 16 core processors for laptops too, if you're willing to, to keep them plugged in most of the time because they do take more power. But the bottom line is there's a lot of advances in hardware that are leading to a proliferation of cores. Moreover, modern operating systems, modern middleware are now able to take advantage of these cores. And so we're gonna talk about the ways that we can do that from a variety of points of view in this class. I've taught courses like this for decades now, and in my experience, it's not enough just to understand the theory of microservices and the theory of concurrent and parallel programming, but you really need to apply it in practice. And the way I do this is by focusing on software patterns, as well as a variety of different programming paradigms, such as object-oriented programming, functional programming, and reactive programming, and of course, design for all those things as well. So in this course, you'll get a chance to get hands-on experience, particularly with functional programming and reactive programming. That's the main set of paradigms we're going to be covering here. And we'll be doing all kinds of hands-on software development. You'll be running test cases. We'll talk a bit more about how you'll get a chance to use generative AI techniques and so on and so forth in order to make your applications that you build more robust and more performant. Something else, of course, that's important that's alluded to on this slide, we also want to write code that's easier to read and write, easier to maintain and modify, and more efficient and resilient. And one of the nice things about what we'll cover is you can often get the, the best of, of both worlds. You can get things that are more uh, producible and productive from a human perspective, as well as more performant from a computing infrastructure perspective. So what are we going to talk about in the course? There are three primary topics we're going to cover in the context of microservices. The first is going to be Java streams, which is essentially a way of being able to break up your processing tasks into small pieces and then compose them together using functional programming, a functional programming model called the streams framework. And that model is inherently synchronous for the most part, unless you do other things like combine it with completable futures. We're not going to be focusing on completable futures in this course. I covered that last semester for those of you in my class. So we're going to first start by talking about Java streams, and then we're going to talk about an advance called reactive streams. 
And reactive streams is a newer paradigm. Streams came out in Java about 2014 or so. Reactive streams came out a few years after that. And the focus of reactive streams is largely on asynchronous composition of asynchronously operating tasks or behaviors. And we'll talk about that, and you'll get a chance to play around with something called Web Flux and Project Reactor. For those of you who took my class last semester where we did Rx Java, some of this will be review, but there'll be all kinds of other things we'll do that we didn't cover at all last semester. And then the third topic we're going to focus on will be something called structured concurrency, which is a very new model that's been added to Java in the last year or so. And it basically provides something akin to structured programming or streams style programming, where you can have your computations processed by things called uh, tasks. And we're going to see how there's all kinds of interesting tasks you can do with structured concurrency model. And these tasks can be run in the context of something called virtual threads. And that's also a very fascinating topic that we'll cover very quickly. Very important for what uh, you'll need to know in this class. So those are the three main paradigms. We'll also be focusing on modern web programming platforms. And in this context, we're going to focus on something called Spring Web MVC, where MVC is an acronym that stands for Model View Controller, and something called Spring Web Flux. And Spring Web MVC is something that's called the so-called servlet stack, which uses synchronous blocking I.O. with a one thread one request per thread model, or if we use virtual threads, it's one thread per request that's a virtual request. And then we're also going to talk about something called Spring Web Flux, which is a non-blocking or asynchronous web framework. And this will be great because you're going to get exposed to the latest and greatest ways of building systems that are designed to be scalable and robust and hopefully uh, capable of being able to scale effectively as the number of cores and, and the number of, of computers in a system increases. So you'll get a lot of chance to play around with that stuff. Of course, we're going to be touching on patterns for concurrent and parallel programming throughout the course. I've done lots of work for decades in the area of software patterns, so you'll get a chance to learn uh, from some of that stuff as well. Now, there's a couple of assumptions baked in here. I assume that you either know or can very quickly learn modern Java, and we'll, we'll cover some modern Java here, but the modern Java, I expect you to be able to either know or learn primarily Java functional programming. So things like Lambda expressions, method references, functional interfaces. These are all things I covered in my previous semester. If you need a refresher on any of this stuff, take a look at item number 12 in the Frequently Asked Questions page in my GitHub repository for this course, the CS891 course. By the way, just a quick note, all the slides that I present here will be released in PDF form and available on my website shortly after class, might be later today or later this evening, but you can always take the slides and, and click on the little links and, and follow the path. So don't feel like you have to try to write these things down in real time. We're also gonna be applying large language models throughout the course where appropriate. If you take a look at the link at the bottom of this slide, that's the policy guidance from Vanderbilt on the use of generative AI in our courses. And the cut to the cut to the uh, bottom line, it's up to the instructors to decide what you can do with generative AI. And so it's perfectly fine to use generative AI for the programming assignments. We'll talk more about that. And uh, there are some things that you need to be more careful about with generative AI, and we'll talk about that too. <clears throat> the reason we're doing this is because it's pretty clear that large language models are having a massive impact on education and on the workforce. If you want to get more perspective on this from myself and some of my colleagues at Vanderbilt, like Professor Jules White and Professor Jesse Spencer Smith, take a look at the playlist that's at the bottom of this slide. Again, you can get the links here shortly when I release the slides. And this has about 30 videos that go through many different aspects of using ChatGPT and other large language models in various ways for education and computer science and so on. So let's talk briefly about how the lecture material is going to be structured. So 
there are three main modules that we're going to bounce around with in the course. The first is on structured concurrency and reactive streams. So we're going to talk about those concepts, and we'll talk a little bit about Java streams as well, just so you'll have the background. We'll spend a lot of time with Spring Web MVC and Spring Web Flux. That comes right from the beginning. We'll start talking about that in just a few minutes. Some patterns that we talked about. And typically, we have a bunch of lessons, and each lesson is composed of parts. And each part is a single lecture. And I'm going to take screencasts of each part and the PDF slides that go along with it, and I'll upload them to that link at the bottom of the slides. You don't have to memorize that either. If you go to my website, which is easy to find because you just Google me if you don't get the link, just go to uh, this link, which is also in the Piazza posting, so you can click on it. You'll find where the lectures are located. And there'll be bi-weekly quizzes on the material that we cover in the lectures. The first quiz, which will not be a very long quiz for obvious reasons, will be a week from Wednesday. And that will cover the topics that we cover in this class and Wednesday. Keep in mind, Monday is a day off, so there's no class. Something important, all quizzes are closed book, closed note, closed internet, closed chat GPT, closed any large language model and so on, and will be given on Brightspace. So you, you should know how to do that by now, hopefully, if you've used Right space before. We'll do our best to try to get the quizzes handed back at the start of the next class so that I can go over the quizzes and make sure everybody's comfortable with the scores that you got. And that's one of the benefits of not having like 150 people in the class. We have about 40 or so, which should make it doable to do this. How should you study for the quizzes? The way I recommend you do that is by reviewing the slides and or watching the screencasts. And now that we're in the brave new world of large language models, one of the really cool things you can do is you can use a Chrome plugin called GLASP, G-L-A-S-P. And if you integrate the GLASP plugin into your Chrome browser, whenever you go to YouTube, it gives you the option of being able to, to use ChatGPT to analyze the transcript of the video. And so a good way to do that is to go to go to my videos, look at the transcript with GLASP, and then ask yourself quiz questions that would be in the in the lecture. So you can get a summary of what's in the lecture. You could ask it, you know, if you, there's a topic in there that is important to you that you're maybe a little fuzzy on, you can say, you know, what are the key capabilities that Spring WebFlux provides in terms of communication and uh, concurrency or something? And you can basically quiz yourself. It's a great way to have a 24-7 essentially free tutor that will help you master the material, which is really fantastic. Depending on various factors, there may be a cumulative final that covers all the lectures, but of course we'll focus on the last weeks of the semester. That final exam, if it's held, may be held here by a bright space. And the reason we do it as a tentative uh, dimension is because it might very well turn out that we have a, a programming assignment that starts encroaching into the exam week. And if that's the case, we don't have a final exam. So uh, most likely won't have a final exam, but maybe we will. So that's the end of the first part of the overview of the course. There's a couple more parts we're gonna go through in a second, but at this point, I'm happy to take any questions.